the one state of the human heart beneath all other beautiful states that can be born from it of the human heart that gives glory to God is faith. Romans 4.20 He grew strong in his faith giving glory to God. Faith makes God be seen as glorious like he really is. So what is it about faith that shows God to be glorious? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper opens Romans 4, 16 to 21 to highlight how Abraham's faith against all odds magnified God's faithfulness and power. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on September 26, 1999. Father, you have mercifully met us in this hour. And I want you to stay and continue to work now as we continue to worship over your word. This is a great word from your inspired apostle concerning faith and promise and glory. And unless you come and open our eyes and tune our ears cut the calluses off of our souls, we will be dead to these glorious things and they will have no saving, sanctifying, rejoicing, healing, comforting, reconciling, emboldening, sweetening, humbling effect upon our lives. And we want them to have that kind of effect. So come, establish your presence here now in power over this word. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 16 is where we focused last week, and so I want to draw your attention there. We talked about the faith-grace certainty connection. Let's just read it, you'll see it. For this reason, it is by faith. Justification is by faith. The promise is by faith. In order that it may be in accordance with grace, faith, grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed, certain, faith, grace, certainty, to all the descendants, meaning both Jews who believe and Gentiles who have the faith of Abraham. So there's the faith, grace, certainty connection. And what we did was zero in on the grace, certainty connection and talk about why it is that grace guarantees the promise. And there were two reasons. Number one... Looking backward in the text, we saw that grace overrides our demerit as we approach God. So here we come, sinners, into the presence of a holy God. What chance is there that we will not be incinerated? No chance, except for one thing, grace. Wrapping us up in the righteousness of God, overriding our demerit and welcoming us into the presence of a holy God in love and acceptance and forgiveness. That's called grace. And without it, there'd be no guarantee of any promise. So that's the first reason why grace leads to guarantee. Here's the second one. Grace is not only the override of our demerit, it is a power to bring into being out of nothing what doesn't exist and to bring life where there's only spiritual deadness. And we saw that in verse 17. You see it there? God gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. And what he has in his mind here is Isaac. Abraham is 99 years old. 
Sarah is 90. She's been barren all her life, has a dead womb, it says in verse 19. They're both beyond childbearing fertility years. And God says, Ishmael is not the son. Hagar is not the wife. Sarah is the wife. Abraham's the husband. I will create seed. And that's a picture of how all children of promise come into being. We saw that from Galatians chapter 4. Everybody in this room who's a child of promise, who's going to inherit the promise, comes into being that way. Meaning, human resources can't make Christians. God makes Christians. God, according to verse 17, gives life to the dead, calls into being that which does not exist, namely a life of faith. And so, what is it in my heart that accords with this kind of grace which guarantees the promise that I will be an heir of the world? And the answer is, one state of my heart in its primary righteousness embracing power one state of my heart accords with grace namely faith it is by faith in order that it might accord with grace so that the promise might be certain so faith grace certainty Your only hope for a certain saved future is not your fickle will, but God's sovereign grace that raises the dead and brings out of nothing in your dead heart what you need to inherit the promise. And sustains you there according to the new covenant promises in Jeremiah 32, 40 and numerous other places. Now, my question is this. Why is it that God has ordained for faith to be that which secures the promise for me? Why not some other grace? Why not some other thing besides faith? What is it about faith? Why faith? Why is faith what God has ordained to receive the promise that we will be heirs of the world? Reason number one, chapter 3, verse 27, faith excludes boasting. And God hates boasting. What has become of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? A law of works? No. A law of faith. Faith excludes boasting. That's reason number one why God ordains faith to be the means of the inheritance. Reason number two. If justification were by law or works, the promise would be nullified because the law brings wrath. Verse 14. Reason number three, the reason he has ordained faith to be the means of our inheritance is because faith accords with grace. Verse 16. Now, what's the new reason today? It's found in verse 20. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief. But he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. So reason number four, why God ordains faith to be the means of inheriting, is that faith glorifies God. Let's read it again. Make sure you see the connections. Yet with respect to the promise of God, this is verse 20, Abraham did not waver in unbelief. But he grew strong in faith, thus giving glory to God. Thomas Watson was a Puritan pastor 350 years ago in England, and he wrote a good book called The Body of Divinity. 
And in it, he asked this question. Why should faith justify more than any other grace? And here's his answer. Because of God's purpose, he has appointed this grace to be justifying, and he has done it because faith is a grace that takes man off of himself and gives all honor to Christ and to free grace. And then he quotes our text, Romans 4.20. Strong in faith, giving glory to God. So let's think about this. I hope you know, I think most of you know, giving God glory does not mean adding to God's glory from your little deposit. It doesn't mean improving upon God's gloriousness. Doesn't mean heightening his own perfections or worth or value or beauty. What it means is calling attention to God's glory. Showing it to be what it really is. And what is it? What is the glory of God? We talk about it. What is it? And I'll give you three phrases that are the best I can do biblically to try to get a handle on the ineffable. The glory of God is the greatness of his beauty. Or the glory of God is the shining out of all of his excellencies. Or the glory of God is the radiance of all his perfections. So I grope. I grope for uh, places to point. So let me go back to Thursday. Remember Thursday afternoon? Thursday's my day off. I try to take a day off. And I took Thursday off, most of it anyway. And uh, Thursday, therefore, is a date day with my woman <laughs> named Noel. And uh, we don't spend a lot of money, so we went to a little Mexican place. And on that day, perhaps the last day off where they'll do this this fall, the patio was open. And so we took our burrito and fajita, and we went out and sat down at this little round white table under the sky. And I put my legs up in the chair, there are four chairs, so I said, let's try to use them all. <laughs> and the breeze was cool and the sun was warm and I looked up and I thought to myself, now, if I were going to build a roof over the city of Minneapolis, about 50 miles up, and paint it, that's the way I'd make it look. Only it's there for free. No effort on any part of anybody. And painted more beautifully with these white wisps against that deep blue. And have you noticed... That if you look straight up, it's deep blue. And if you look at an angle, it's light blue. Have you ever noticed that? There's a reason for that. It's thinner straight up and the big black is closer. And I thought of Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Here's another glorious human being. Glory. I saw it. I heard it. I felt it on my skin and in my wife. It is undefinable, but you know it when you see it. The day was glorious. The aim of every person in this room, as God has designed you and all other things, is to glorify God. Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. 
To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The one state of the human heart beneath all other beautiful states that can be born from it of the human heart that gives glory to God is faith. Romans 4.20 He grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God. Faith makes God be seen as glorious, like he really is. Now I ask, why is this? Why does faith give glory to God? And before I answer that, let me stress this. It is so crucial for you to know this is why you exist. You know what's wrong with the world? There's one basic thing wrong with the world. And it's defined in Romans 1.23. They exchange the glory of God for lesser things. That's what's wrong with the world. Every human being is created to display the glory of God. That's why you exist. This week passed. The population of planet Earth on Wednesday afternoon passed six billion. At least that's what I read. I know what every one of them is on planet Earth for. Because the Bible makes crystal clear God created every one of them for his glory. To display his glory. To refract out into the world through their unique personhood his glory. And what's wrong with the world? Hardly anybody does this. We have, we have seen the glory of God in the heavens. We have known the glory of God in our consciences and we have traded it away for a bowl of oatmeal like Esau. That's what's wrong with the world. Is it any doubt that the world goes haywire when the vast majority of the people don't do what they were created to do? Human beings don't function right when they're not doing what they're created to do. It is a marvel to me. It is an absolute marvel to me that there is not total anarchy and chaos in Minneapolis. Because of the small percentage of the population who live for the glory of God. There is one reason why there's not massive East Timorese-like looting in downtown Minneapolis this morning. There's only one main reason. Common grace. All we need is a little shaking here. The IDS tumbles over. Policemen go on strike. And the real Minneapolis would show itself in a minute. Just like it's showing itself every place where the powers that can bring consequences to bear on looting shows itself. We're a squeaky clean city because we have certain traditions which are owing to God. Very Lutheran, very Catholic, little teeny bit of Baptists. And those traditions have enough good in them and enough truth in them that a cap is being kept on the lid here or on the volatile sea of sin in this city. And there is relative order, which is a marvelous common grace. But you were created for the glory of God. And God is in the business now with those who are headed for Turkey and those who are headed for work tomorrow morning in filling the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14. God is reclaiming his creation. He will reclaim it. Those who will not have it, who will only boast in themselves instead of giving him all glory, 
will be excluded from the new heavens and the new earth. So it matters. It really, really matters. If you don't live for the glory of God, if you don't get up in the morning and think, for the glory of God, and lunch for the glory of God, and come home for the glory of God, and go to bed for the glory of God, if you don't function that way so that the glory of God is the reason for your being and the governing of all your choices so that you can say with the apostle, whether I eat or whether I drink or whatever I do, I do all to the glory of God. Don't be surprised if your life is a shadow of the substance God designed it to be. Anybody feel like a shadow in this room? Instead of substance. I like substance people. People with substance. They're not a shadow of another substance. They're substance. There's something there to get a hold of spiritually. It's a deep, powerful, uranium-like thing. And those are the people who are passionate for the glory of God. Whether they're the quiet type or the explosive type, doesn't make any difference. But their substance, not to live for the glory of God, is to be a shadow of the substance you were meant to have. In God. Not to live for the glory of God is to be an echo of the music you were designed to make. Anybody feel like an echo instead of music being played out of your soul toward God, toward angels? Not to live for the glory of God is to be a residue of the impact. You were meant to have in this world. Anybody here feel like a residue of an impact? You don't have to be a shadow, an echo, a residue. If you become thrilled with the glory of God above computers and sports and clothes and money and profession and approval... You know the kind of people who are substantial people. They don't live secondhand lives looking over their shoulder to wonder what people are thinking. They don't care what people think. They are so substantial in themselves and in their relationship to the living God. They let the chips fall and say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done because God is their substance and he's within and his glory is one day going to satisfy their hearts. Like it says in Romans 5, we were justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God and having been justified, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So I ask again, why does faith do this? Why does faith give glory to God? Here's the answer, verse 21. Because faith is being fully assured of what God has promised. Fully assured that he is able to perform it. You see that in verse 21? Being fully assured that what God had promised, he is able to perform. And the harder the promise is to fulfill, the more glory God gets when you believe he will fulfill it. Which is why verses 19 and 20 draw out how hard it was for God to fulfill this promise to Abraham. Let's read verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. And he contemplated the deadness of Sarah's womb. So the fulfillment of a child called Isaac, child of promise, is impossible. Hundred year old men don't have babies. And women who are barren with dead wombs who are 99, don't have babies. So it's over. It's history. There's no human possibility. Now, how do you make God look good at that moment? 
When God says, you're going to have a son. Next year, his name will make it Isaac. You and this old woman, you're going to have a son. How do you make God look really good at that moment? Answer, you believe him. You believe him. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 13-part series, Faith That Justifies, with a sermon titled, Future-Oriented Faith. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.